Hello everyone, Victor is here, and in this video I want to summarize the substitution and elimination reactions and show you the predictive model that you can use to determine the mechanisms of your reaction. If you haven't seen my videos on the SN1, SN2, E1 and E2 mechanisms, I strongly encourage you first watch those and then come back to this video. So let's start by quickly reviewing the important features of each mechanism. The SN1 reactions are unimolecular reactions and their rate only depends on the concentration of the substrate, which is typically the alkyl halide. The rate determining step in the SN1 reaction is the carbocation formation. And carbocations are the major source of all troubles with the SN1 reactions. Because of the carbocation intermediates, we are going to see the racemization, which means the loss of the stereochemistry and possible carbocation rearrangements. Also, since the primary carbocations and CH3 plus are too unstable for our purposes, we are not really going to see SN1 reactions with primary substrates unless they are resonance stabilized. The SN1 reactions also require polar product solvents like acids or alcohols. The solvent is extremely important for the SN1 reaction, as without it there will be no reason for the living group dissociation. Additionally, the solvent typically is the nucleophile in the SN1 reaction as well. The E1 reactions have a lot of similarities with the SN1 reactions, as they also share the mechanistic pathway and the carbocation intermediate. So they are also unimolecular reactions, they also form carbocations, and they also do not work for primary and uh, CH3 for the methyl carbocations, so we typically only want to see the resonance stabilized tertiary or secondary carbocations. On top of that, like in the case of the SN1, we are expecting carbocation rearrangements when possible and racemization, and like SN1 reactions, they also like polar product solvents. The difference here is that typically E1 reactions are favored at higher temperatures than the SN1 reactions, and also, E1 reactions favor the formation of the more substituted double bond, which is known as Zaitsev product. The SN2 reactions are bimolecular reactions, which means that their rate depends on the concentration of both the substrate and the nucleophile. There are also concerted processes, which means that we are not going to be forming any kind of intermediate whatsoever. The SN2 reactions have a strict requirement to the nature of the nucleophilic attack. Namely, they require the backside attack, which makes them extremely sensitive to any kind of steric hindrances and it causes the inversion of the steric configuration in the molecule. Finally, the SN2 reactions are favored in the presence of the polar A product solvents, such as DMSO, DMF, THF, and so on. And those solvents help making our nucleophile more aggressive by solvating the cations. The E2 reactions are quite similar to SN2 reaction in the sense that they are also bimolecular processes in which the reaction depends on the concentration of the substrate and the concentration of a base in this case, not the nucleophile. Preferably, we want a strong base. And talking of which, we are going to separate our bases into two distinct categories. We have small bases that typically give Zaitsev product, and we have bulky bases that typically give the Hoffman product. Or, in other words, the Zaitsev product is the more substituted double bond, the more substituted alkene, while the bulky bases they give you a Hoffman product, which is the less substituted alkene or a less substituted double bond. Additionally, the E2 reactions they are extremely sensitive to the conformation of the transition state, and they do require you to have the antiperiplanar hydrogen and the living group in your molecule. So if we cannot find an antiproton in the beta position, the E2 reaction is simply going to be impossible. Alright, so now when we have refreshed the substitution and elimination reactions in our heads, let's dive into the predictive model itself. And the predictive model I propose here is based on three-step approach. First, we are going to assess the nature of our reagents. Our reagents are going to fit into four categories. They can be nucleophiles only, nucleophiles or bases, bases only, and poor base and nucleophiles. Once we categorize our reagents, we'll have to move to the position of our living group and see where it is. The living group, of course, can be either primary, secondary, or tertiary. 
we're also specifically going to point out allylic and benzylic positions because they have their own intricacies and we must keep those in mind as well. They don't quite fit into the model very well. So once we know all of that, we can determine mechanism by plugging the pieces into the model and see if we fit any exceptions or any special criteria that we might have and we don't really have too many of those special cases. So now, when we know the basic outline of the model, let's talk about those categories and a few more details starting with the nature of our reagent. First, Let's look at the nucleophile only category. Those are typically the ions like halide, cyanide, azide, phosphorus, or sulfur containing compounds, uh, carboxylates, etc. Typically, nucleophile only compounds are the species that have a relatively low pKa of the conjugate acids, so the pKaH values. I suggest you keep the rough pKaH cutoff at around 9 or so. So anything with a conjugate acid stronger than that is not very basic and it is unlikely to pull off a proton from a non-acidic compound. So let me review that one more time. When we are talking about the conjugate acids, so let's say I have the cyanide, CN minus. So CN minus is a base and the conjugate acid of the cyanide is going to be HCN and HCN PKA that value is somewhere around 9. It's a smidgen higher than 9, like 9.2 or something like that, if I remember correctly. So that means having a pKa of 9, it is a mediocre acid, so it's going to make a mediocre base. It's neither strong nor weak, it's somewhere in the middle of the way. But the cyanide is a wonderful nucleophile. Likewise, if let's say I look at acidic acid, at the acetate ion like this, so when I take this guy and I convert it into the conjugate acid, we're going to have acidic acid and the pKa of the acidic acid is going to be around 4.8. So again, it is already a stronger acid, which means it's going to be a weaker base. If I look at something like Cl-, well for that one the conjugate acid is going to be HCl and the pKa value for the HCl is going to be somewhere around negative 7. That means that HCl is a very strong acid, so as a base, Cl- is going to be a rather weak base. So we are not going to be really expecting our Cl- to uh, perform any kind of acid-base chemistry in the reaction. So next, nucleophile and base category typically includes non-sterically hindered uh, alkoxides like methoxide, ethoxide, etc. Usually those different species have pKa values that are typically over 16, but under 30 when we are talking about the conjugate acids again. So we are not looking at the pKa values of the base itself, we are talking about the pKa uh, value of the conjugate acids. So for instance for water, which I have over here, the conjugate acid is going to be H2O, which is 15.7 when it comes to the pKa. So when it comes to base-only species, we're typically either going to be seeing the ions that are extremely basic and will pull off a proton much faster than doing any kind of nucleophilic attack, so we're talking about bases with the pKa of the conjugate acid over 30. So those are things like LDA over here, or hydride ion, or or amide ion, those are incredibly powerful bases and they will snatch off that proton right away. Or we are going to be talking about extremely bulky species like terbutoxide, DBN or DBU. Those are very large species and they physically have hard time being nucleophiles simply due to their size. Finally, the last category is going to be poor bases and poor nucleophiles, which typically include things like acids, alcohols and other similar species. Normally, when we think about poor base in a nucleophile category, those are going to be most often different polar protic solvents and H plus donors. Overall, I would say it's a really good idea to memorize these categories, so I suggest you copy them down for the future reference because we are going to need them. Now, when it comes to the living groups, they can be primary, secondary or tertiary. So if we add all the reagent types into this predictive model, we end up with a 3 by 4 table with all possible outcomes that's going to look like this. And as you can see, it makes a nice diagonal diagram which is kind of 
easy to remember. So as you can see, most of the decisions here are going to be quite straightforward until we hit the SN1 or E1 reactions. So when it comes to the cases when we are competing SN1 and E1, we are going to look at the temperature of our reaction. Elevated temperatures promote E1 reactions, while lower temperature favor SN1 reactions. Remember to only look at the temperature if you are deciding between SN1 and E1 reactions. It is only going to matter in those cases. In all other cases, temperature will have a very marginal and insignificant effect. I have mentioned that we are going to be talking about the allylic and benzylic positions separately. They don't cleanly fit into this scheme, so they have their own thing going on. When it comes to primary allylic and benzylic substrates, uh, they can go either SN1 or SN2 reactions. So it will be important to look at the solvent in this case. If we have a polar product solvent, we're likely going to be looking at SN1 reactions. If we have polar A product solvent, we are most likely have the case of the SN2 reaction. The thing is, allylic and benzylic positions can make resin and stabilize carbocations, which is good for SN1. They are also very reactive in the SN2 reactions due to the molecular orbital interactions in the molecule itself, plus the lack of the steric hindrances make SN2 reactions favorable. So in reality, we are likely to have some sort of a competition between the two mechanisms. The secondary allylic and benzylic substrates, they typically favor the elimination reactions when possible, of course. Due to the additional stability of the resulting conjugate system, the E2 is more favorable than the SN2 even with weaker bases in these cases. For the same reason, E1 pathway is more favorable than SN1. However, you would still have to analyze the system and see what's the most logical outcome based on the conditions in the substrate structure itself. For instance, if there is no suitable proton for the E2 reaction, the SN2 will be the likely case. So in a nutshell, everything is a fair game for those substrates and that makes them the most complicated ones to analyze. Finally, tertiary allylic and benzylic positions are quite similar to the secondary ones. However, the SN2 reactions are going to be impossible due to the steric restrictions in this case. So this is the predictive model which is going to give you the correct answer in 99% of cases. The only time when it fails is when we have some sort of trickery going on in our molecule. So take a screenshot of this scheme, or better yet, copy it down and memorize it. I can guarantee it will be a saving boat on the test. You may also have noticed that I barely touched upon the solvents in the scheme. This is because the solvent is a facilitator of the reaction and it barely determines the mechanism itself. So don't hang up on the solvent and only look at it at the very end if you are still unsure which mechanism to pick, like for instance in the case of the allylic and benzylic substrates that I just mentioned. In most other cases, the solvent won't really change what's going on. Rather, it will only make reaction go slower if we have a mismatching solvent for the mechanism. So, what do you think about the predictive model? Wanna see it in action? Then, make sure you give this video a like, subscribe and enable the notifications so you don't miss my next video where I show you how to use this model to solve various substitution and elimination problems. Till then, you have yourself an awesome day and I'll see you in the next video!